Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. Well, gold and silver, they have been relentlessly hammered in price ever since 2011. Day after day in the paper markets, gold and silver, they're sold off times in the dead of night when thin trading volume prevails. We see massive sale orders come in and completely swamp the bids, cut through them to a new lower price. Now, such moves are absolutely not about someone trying to get a best execution for their trade. They're clearly designed to move prices around, almost always to a lower price, but not always. Sometimes, very rarely of late, we see the opposite, and we see massive orders blow out the asks above the current price. Now, such trading is obviously of the few, by the few, and for the few, and it's the mark of very big players using their massive weight to shove things around for their own benefit. And the regulators never investigate. Nobody ever gets in trouble for such obvious market manipulations. And we have to wonder, well, why not? Now, such shenanigans have simply been part of our new normal, I guess. But how much longer can this continue? To discuss this as well as what he sees in the more important physical market, we have today legendary resource investor and philanthropist Eric Sprott, of Sprott Asset Management. His experience stretches back four decades, so he's seen it all. The highs, the lows, the ebbs, the flows, and most importantly, the ways in which the market structure has been modified, dare I say, perverted. Welcome, Eric. Hey, Chris. Uh, I share your frustration. I've been through it all. You know, we've, we've, a lot of us can predict things that happen, but the trouble is we don't know when it's going to happen. But uh, I think there's lots of great things that uh, we can talk to that might give uh, precious metals investors a lot of comfort that things that are going on in the market right now. Well, let's start there. Let, let's start with the price of gold. Uh, in your experience, and silver too, in your experience, sure. here, what, what's been driving the price of gold and silver lower? Uh, and, and i got to tell you, I'm watching, here, here's, here's the variable I see. The more they print the lower gold goes. I don't understand right. this relationship, but what do you see? Well, you know, Chris, I'd go back to when silver was 49.50, and it was about to break to new highs, and, you know, all hell would have broken loose, okay? And you will recall that on a Sunday night at 9.30, with the Chinese market closed that day, silver goes down $6 an ounce, and bang, the CME comes out with margin rate increases. And, of course, it had the perfect impact because the, guy, the investor had already lost, uh, you know, 15 14% of his money, and bang, he's got, a, he's got a margin rate increase. To be followed in succession by, I think it was another seven margin rate increases. And even at the time, you know, when it was at 49.50, we traded a billion three ounces a day while uh, we only produce 800 million ounces a year. It's the most bizarre thing you've ever seen. And, I mean, that was just a first sign of interference on a massive scale in the market with, as you point out, the complicity of the regulator, the complicity of the exchange, and they just took the silver investors to the cleaners. In the more, some of the more recent examples, I mean, you point to the example where they banged it with, uh, I think it was, they started hitting it at 1230 at the, at, in the evening when everyone's kind of on lunch break and there, there's no action in the market. I, I debate to some extent whether these might be hedge funds who think that in, you know, in a small physical market in a way, they can take advantage of it just by dumping huge amounts of paper on the market. And maybe they've seen you know, the effect of central banks in there before and say, well, if we just play this game properly, we can, we can score big on this. And I've always contended that you know, there, there is a shortage of gold and silver. And I wrote an article in December 12, questioning whether the central banks had any gold left. And I find it very instructive and ironic that in 2013, when they did the raid on gold, that the ETFs coughed up something like 800 tons of gold. The gold ETF did, okay? And um, that 800 tons was needed that year to supply the excess demand, and that's where they got it. Um, and what, one of the other things that sort of tells you that, and, and that it was engineered, is when you look at the SLV, it lost nothing that year. 
And yet we're all told that gold and silver are horrible things. You don't want to own them. And all, they both went down about the same. Silver probably went down even more, but yet didn't lose any tonnage. And I always love to ask people, why do you think there was no silver taken out of the silver trust? And I come, the only answer I have is they didn't need silver. They needed gold. They needed gold to balance off the demand from China and India and all those things. And in fact, even in 2013, I'm sure that the central planners went to the uh, Bank of India and said, you've got to do something about your people buying gold here. Because I think in that first month, the month of May of uh, 2013, they bought something like 168 tons, which is almost all the mine production in one month for one country. And, of course, then they came in with their 80-20 rule and about 10 other rules. And by the time we got to November, I think we're down to about 7 tons a month of imports, which aided and abetted yet again. Uh, the manipulators. So you, you know the central planners are in there somewhere, right? And and then I think maybe some of the hedge funds get on this thing, well, hey, this, we can really knock this down and nobody's going to complain, and, and it just goes on and on and on. And, of course, the only solution is the physical solution, and I think things are happening as we look at all the data uh, to suggest that that should come to an end here. Now, I look at this exactly the same way. I look at there, there's hard fundamental data that we can get our hands on. I consider it, this is the, okay, let me start here. Gold is one of the most opaque markets I know about. I can't get any information on what actually happens in the OTC market in, in terms of um, flows in, mm -hmm. in London. I can't, I, I talk to people who are in the OTC market. They don't have insights into it. They have their own little slice. We have a little bit of information coming out of COMEX, and people chew through those numbers endlessly, but the COMEX figures are tiny compared to the OTC flows that are happening in, in London, which, again, are, are heavily shielded. But we do have some information. We see what's flowing out of the Shanghai Gold Exchange. We have some import numbers from India. Just those two alone, we get well over 100% of mine production. And so we know that gold, to balance the accounts, has to be coming from somewhere. Again, who, yeah. where? I don't know. But we have yeah. this softer information. I'd love to get your point of view on. So we had the Bundesbank, the people of Germany said, we want our gold back, much gnashing of teeth. Bundesbank dragged its heels, said, okay, 300 tons over seven years. <laughs> managed, managed to move five tons in the first year. Woo, you know, <laughs> it's like a, right. like a tiny amount. And then we see what's happening with the Swiss referendum, where the Swiss people have said, hey, we want to have 20% of our reserves, such as we hold them, in gold, and we want all that gold in our country. And the Swiss National Bank is just raising a stink, pretending this is going to be the hardest thing to do since raising the dead. And I'm just wondering, do, don't, what do those indicate to you when you see those central banks acting that way? Sure. Well, you know, Chris, I go back to some of the data that we have even from that happened in 2011 to 2013, and we see the Chinese buying an extra 1,000 tons, okay? And let's call the, uh, the gold market a 4,000-ton market just for rounding. And, and they came in and bought an extra 1,000 tons. That's 25% of the market. And I always make the point, how could anybody come in and buy 25% of any market out of nowhere and have the price go down? And we had the same thing happen in silver last year, where because the Indians couldn't buy gold, they started buying silver. They buy an extra 18% of the silver market, above and beyond what they were buying normally, and the price of silver goes down. And I might even point out that that 18%, theoretically only half the silver is available for investment, so that 18% is really 36% of all the silver that could be bought for investment purposes. And they came in and, and knew and bought it, and the price went down. And it just tells you how anomalous the whole thing is and how kind of orchestrated, because it makes no sense vis-a-vis -vis the physical stuff. You mentioned the, uh, the um, Swiss referendum. And you know everyone's aware that PayPal shot off the payments to the Yes campaign. And it just it shows you that the powers that be will do everything they can to prevent normalcy happening in the market. I mean, that's just uh, almost utterly unbelievable that for some reason you can't send money to a political campaign in Switzerland. <laughs> and it, it's just egregious. And it, it's like... You know, there was a, a report on Zero Hedge not too long ago suggesting that the press was asked not to talk about Ebola. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I can, I can understand that request going out. I mean, that's probably why they had the Ebola czar there. To make, that was probably his first decision. <clears throat> Let's not talk about it. And sure enough, of course, just before the election, there wasn't really a lot of chat about it. And I think it's because, you know, the president thought, gee, I mean, I'll get elected if, 
if somebody told the truth about Ebola, and so they just muzzle it. And it's this whole freakish things that go on in, to protect financial markets, to protect the seemingly powerful in politics, that just it, it frustrates us and it just draws our ire. I, I'm kind of happy to see that people in various countries in uh, Europe are protesting, which they should do. The middle class is getting wrung out here. You know, there's always unintended consequences of printing money and nothing going to the economy. And meanwhile, at one end of the spectrum, the retired people can't get any return on the money. At the other end of the spectrum, the cost of education skyrockets. Everyone has a loan. They don't get a good job. And we have huge swaths of the population at each end that are not prospering. And it's, it's not a good, it's, it's no wonder that new home sales are probably still a third of what they used to be uh, eight or ten years ago. Who, who, can, who, who could possibly afford to buy a home with the credit posture that they have coming out of the university today and the types of jobs they get? So, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty devastating what, what we have to live with. And it's frustrating for someone like me who's like you. I was all over the housing crisis, the NASDAQ crash, the financial crash of 2008. As I've always thought, boy, if they start printing money, the price of gold will go up. And, of course, I, one of the reasons that they want the price of gold not to go up, because you could have imagined if it would have gone through $2,000 at the time and if silver would have gone through 50. I mean, it just it would have told the world that, the policy of, of printing money is ridiculous, which we all know it's ridiculous, but people want to see some manifestation of the market to show it's ridiculous, and that's why I think they they have repressed it here. But, you know, the, the day is going to come to an end. We have a lot, as I said, we have a lot of positive things we could talk about that are going on in the physical markets right now uh, that could change this dynamic very quickly. You touched on so many great points here, Eric, and I, I think we've got... Um, a recent example that, that sort of pulls them all together, which was the Halloween massacre that Kuroda of the Bank of Japan pulled off on, on Friday, October 31st, right? They come out with a surprise announcement timed specifically to impact the markets the most, that Japan is really going to double down and do more to the point that the Bank of Japan is now going to be monetizing more than 100% of all new issuance of get Japanese government bonds that are being issued out as they run a deficit. They're going to destroy the currency. They've basically said, we're going to eviscerate our lower and middle classes, and we're going to take the wealth we take from them through lower purchasing power. We're going to transfer it to our exporters. So we think that Toyota deserves those, those, the money of our people more than the people do. That's a decision they've made. It killed the yen. And of course, what happened with this announcement of a surprise decision to A, begin destroying a major currency, and B, uh, to print a lot more money and toss it in the markets, gold just got slaughtered, right? And I, I see that in the context of saying, what if gold had gone up instead? It would have said, that would have been a vote saying, we don't like what you're doing, and the world would have received that appropriately. But instead, we got this thing that says, the world apparently said, oh, we think that's the least risky thing you can do. So much, we're really going to dump on gold here. I, I can't see these moves anymore through a lens of normal market reactions. I don't understand them. I think that what goes on in the gold market... When there's something gold-friendly, I think they arrange to have the price go lower so that you can never attach a reason, a real reason for gold doing something. Yeah. That's a perfect example. I mean, here we had on Wednesday, we, we end QE and they bomb gold. Then on Thursday, we start QE over in, in Japan and we bomb gold. Yeah. And it's just like, how do you win in this game, right? It's ridiculous. And it's funny when you, when you mention Japan. I mean, here we've had the currency go down 40%. I mean, everybody in Japan should own gold. <laughs> Why, exactly. why would you own yen with, with almost an a, a indicated desire of knocking the currency down? And I haven't seen many, uh, much data from Japan, but you'd think a few people over there would figure it out and try to protect themselves. So, yeah. But there are, you know, I mentioned that there's a lot of physical things going on. And, I mean, some of the recent data, uh, for example, we see almost 60 tons a week being delivered in the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Well, you start annualizing 60 tons a week, you're talking 3,000 tons a year now. We saw 94 tons of gold go into, um, into India in September. We saw the Russian Central Bank buy 37 tons of gold in September. I mean, I could come up with numbers that might suggest we got 400 tons a week of, of demand, and we only got 230 tons a week of, of, um, of, of mine supply, and I've only gone to three data points. <laughs> I haven't even gone to the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. 
So, I mean, the, the, that and, for example, you know there's been a lot of discussion about these open interests in silver. The December open interest in silver is about, uh, it's about 530 million ounces. There's about 14 more trading days. And it's been stubbornly high. It hasn't really reacted that much as, as one might normally expect to the, the coming expiry. And there's people that suggest that it may be a group that will ask for delivery. And there's 180 million ounces on of, of COMEX inventory, and I think the dealers own something like 70 of that. And this will be very interesting to watch that and just see what the postings ultimately are. And, of course, I'd love nothing better than people to stand in there and take delivery and put it to the paper shorts. And there's also a high open interest in um, in gold going into December. We also have these the, the coin sales, which, of course, we had an announcement, not an announcement from the U.S. Mint, but it, it was it's known that they said to their distributors that we're out of 2014 coins. That's not to say they won't produce more, but the history of the Mint is a little bit that if there's a lot of demand and it looks excessive, they just don't make any coins because they don't want to stress the supply-demand relationship in silver. Um, and the, the Canadian Mint has already indicated, well, this is two or three weeks ago, that they're on allocation. Every dealer who sells coins has basically said, you know, we're two to three week back orders on, uh, on considerable size orders. So there is a tightness going on here. The Shanghai gold inventory, uh, sorry, silver inventory has gone from 1,100 tons to under 100 tons within the last year. Uh, the gold inventory at the COMEX has gone down by from about 303 tons to 250 tons in about two months. So there's, there's signs here that there's a lot of physical demand. Of course, it makes sense there'd be a lot of physical demand. Anybody who's in the business, we all realize what the hell's going on here. And maybe, you know, finding the hedge funds, the speculative hedge funds, try to push it a little further than they should go. We've had the, the commercials, the banks, have basically are off their short position, and the short position for the most part is now held by the hedge funds, which, and of course, I just believe in all markets, the banks who have this huge power will run any market around any way they want to, and, you know, they'll break it out, and everyone wants to buy, and they'll sell it to them. Then they'll have it break down technically, then they'll buy it back again. And I just think they can just just cream these markets. You know, it's like clearing the table. And whether it's gold or silver or copper, you name the commodity, because they have such huge money power, they can, they can make it look like a certain thing's happening when it's not happening. And maybe that's what's going on in oil today. I mean, we take it down to... You know, from whatever it was, 110 down to 76 dollars. Here, we got an OPEC meeting coming up. Great timing for the election, by the way. Mm-hmm. And and it'll probably run right back up again because they flushed everybody out, and now they probably reloaded. I don't know for for a fact that they have, but I just think there's there's a bit of a game that you know you put all this stuff in your computer, say, hey, we can we can just keep doing this and run it up, run it down, cash it out. And if you can sit there and make you know five percent a month doing this on various commodities. Hey, you're making a lot of money. So I'm totally distrustful of the markets. I mean, I, I loved the article by Paul Singer recently where he said, the job growth is fake, the inflation is fake, the markets are fake, the economic growth is fake. And I just totally believe that. I mean, we are just being fed a line of baloney here that everything's wonderful when, when, when you look at it, it can't be wonderful. Thank God 50 million people are on food stamps. Hmm. Otherwise, we'd have a riot on our hands. You know, there would have been a revolution long ago. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've seen this this same dynamic. You know, I, I travel all over. I get to talk with people all walks of life, and v- everybody's very distrustful of these markets. This has to be like the most hated bull market in stocks ever because people just fundamentally don't believe in it. They know it's it's there's something that just doesn't smell right. And what doesn't smell right is their own daily experience of having to earn a paycheck and, and stretch that out and make that work and their own sense of job security just doesn't match what they're being told. And and so this is all about perception management, which I think was Paul Singer of Elliott Management. His, his main thing was, look, when he says it's all fake, he's like, look, we're just managing the perception. And I think the central banks, you know, when they got in trouble in 2008, instead of saying, hey, you know what happened here was we had been increasing our total borrowing by around 8% per annum for 30 years, but our underlying income was only growing 4% per year. 
that would have been a great time in 2008 to say, maybe that wasn't so smart. Maybe we shouldn't try and borrow our, you know, tw at twice the rate we're earning. But instead of doing that, they doubled down. Derivatives are larger than they were in 2008. Sovereign debt is higher than it used to be. No, covenant light loans are, are off the charts. We've got uh, junk bonds trading with five handles. It's just, it's insane, right? So in this insanity, what do you do? And, and, and I know that the banks are running a very specific program of financial repression. They have negative real interest rates on the book. They have to make sure they have the capital controls firmed up so there's nowhere safer to go, right? So if you're in Europe, it doesn't really help to, to go to America. It doesn't help to go into the Japanese yen. And that's true all across the whole thing. But the third leg of that stool for them always has to be you can't give people uh, something like gold, which gives them a way to preserve their wealth. Because truthfully, Eric, the, the point of all this is to specifically take the wealth of the people and transfer it to the government, but through the central bank's financial repression. This has happened before in history, though. We've seen it. And there's, as far as I know, the only way to dodge this is to be in hard assets. Uh, it's the only way to, to be on the right side of the line when the eventual reset comes. But boy, it's hard to, hard to stick to your guns when, when, they're, uh, when gold and silver are down so much. It really doesn't look like the place to be, does it? Well, you know, I agree with you totally, obviously. And, and uh, having been in it for a long time, this is longer than normal, though, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's lots of times I've been offside in the market. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've been offside, but I can also tell you ultimately what I have thought has always happened. This, we, we've now created a situation, unfortunately, in our market where between high frequency trading and algorithms and interference by the planners, they can make things happen that look like everything's okay. And it's, it's the okay part where I think. Uh, we can really relate to gold not being allowed to go up because that that is the canary in the coal mine. If gold was above $2,000, we'd all be wondering, what the hell is going on here? There's inflation or financial crisis or whatever. And it's, so they haven't allowed it to happen. But by, but by suppressing the price, and one of the great things about a price of 1100 is, you know, you can buy a lot of gold at 1100 versus 1900 mm -hmm. You can buy almost you know, 50, 60 percent more gold than you could four years ago or three years ago with the same amount of money. And you can buy three times the silver with the same amount of money. So, you know, for example, I was a buyer here of silver this week. And, you know, in the 15s, oh, I'm thinking, oh, my God, I can buy a lot of ounces here. And I probably was a buyer at $30. Well, the same money buys me twice as many ounces now. So... It, it, it should, they're just making the market so small that sooner or later somebody's going to figure it out and 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 take it on. It's it's just such a small market. Imagine if the whole inventory is only 15 billion. What the hell is 15 billion in this day and age? It's <laughs> nothing. And a lot of that inventory is already held by people like us and and like-minded people, where it's not coming back on the market. So I'm kind of very hopeful that. Uh, things are going to work out for us. I know it's just been a devastating time, and particularly for people like myself and, and our customers who are in, um, in the mining stocks. I mean, that has just been eviscerated here. But well, by the same token, uh, if it comes back to its senses and, and gold and silver move up here, there's going to be a lot of money made in, in uh, precious metals equities. Let's talk about those miners quickly. I was talking with the CEO of, of one of the largest silver mines in the world uh, last week, and he was saying that his all-in costs were in the 17s. Here we are in the 15s for silver. Uh, how long can it, first of all, obviously there's going to be some wipeouts uh, that, that are going to happen as a consequence of this, but, but where do you see the all-in cash costs of the industry versus how long can the industry persist with silver below their all-in cash costs? Sure. Well, one of the things that, people do is, you know, when, when you have this kind of situation, a miner will try to high grade, okay? So there are ways of, okay, fine, I'm just going to bypass this low grade stuff. If I just do the high grade stuff, I can actually get my cost down. We're seeing some of that happen. Uh, they can also, you know, if you have an open pit mine, you're supposed to strip it in order to, to stay ahead of the game. You might just decide, well, I'm not going to strip it, and maybe I can mine it for a year, with no money spent on stripping, now I know I'm going to have a problem 12 months hence, but I got to get there, and and people do that too, so they can hang in there. I think the most more likely place that uh, something immediate, more immediate, should happen is really in South Africa, 
because you know you're you're mining a a bed that just go on and on and on. There's not, not really development costs, and their costs are so high that at some point they're really losing. You know, two or three hundred an ounce. What's the point of what's the point of trying to produce the stuff? So we haven't seen much on that front yet. But if even if you take a longer term approach, the decline in exploration, the decline in development. You know, where are we going to be in 2016 and 2017 and 2018? Because the average mine life is something like, I think it's less than 10 years. So if you're not looking for new mines, uh, the production has to come down. It's just like, you know, oil. And, and it just depletes itself. So it doesn't deplete as fast as oil, but nonetheless it does deplete. So there'll be a, there'll be a day, if you can take a longer-term view, uh, there's no doubt that the supply going forward is, has got to come down. Well, absolutely. And you mentioned oil. You know, we saw early in 2014 with Brent sitting at about 115 a barrel, all of the world's oil majors said that they were either freezing or trimming their capex because they couldn't explore for oil at 115 and uh, do that and, and return shareholder value and dividends. So they had to pick, right? So they said, right. well, I guess we'll just cut capex and focus on dividends for a while. And that was right. at an oil price a lot higher. So I can only imagine the carnage that's happened to a variety of drill plans and exploration uh, plans that are out there, obviously. And it'll take time to work its way through. But I think anybody who looks forward two or three years can say that supply is not going to be coming online. And uh, where are we going to get that from? Sure. It's even, you know, when I'm buying silver at 15 this week and I bought it at 16 probably two weeks ago, I just think, you know, I know what has to happen here. The price, the price has to go up, okay? And quite frankly, I, I would much rather own a physical asset than a paper asset when we describe all these Ponzi-type things mm -hmm. that are going on. I mean, I mean, it's not fun while it's going down, but you're pretty darn certain you're going to be in the right camp or the winning camp when it's all over. Yeah, well, I bought silver this past weekend. Uh, it was just over 16, and I knew it was a good purchase because I hated doing it. So that, that's my personal. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you gotta you gotta gut it up. But I mean, if the guys can't really produce it for 15, that's pretty solid. Situation. Plus, if you understand the fundamentals of the business, you realize, hey, there's some great things going on in solar. When you think, man, I just think that whole solar thing is just gonna yeah. blow out here. I mean, you can just see it becoming almost universally accepted. And it consumes a lot of silver, and of course, there's all the medical uses and the various other things. So, I, I think we're probably even the Silver Institute last year said there was a shortfall of 100 million ounces, which I don't know where it came from. <laughs> well, you know, back to that fundamental part. When you're noting that you can add up to 400 tons of of uh, monthly demand in a right. world that's only producing 260, you yeah. so. You can't know for sure, but you. this is the fun thing about gold. It's solid, and it's a physical substance. So that extra 140-ton gap had to come from somewhere. That came from real vaults. It came from somewhere. And I, GLD has coughed up what it can. It's, it's, you know, it's much more grudgingly coughing up maybe 10 tons here or there, but it's certainly not yeah. uh, releasing 140 tons. In your mind, where is that coming from? Who's going oh, to that? There's just no, no doubt in my mind. That's all orchestrated by the central planners. Okay, it's coming out of the central banks. I mean, that's just so obvious to me. I mean, we talk about you know the Germans not getting their gold, and now the Swiss asking for the gold. I mean, there's obviously a sentiment there, and as I believe, there is no gold there, right? And the raid last year, luckily, they were able to pump out an extra 800 tons from you know frightening people out of the market. But it's got to be coming from central banks. I believe they got to be down to their last vestiges of, of deliverable gold here, particularly as, and you know, when you start annualizing these rates of demand, uh, they've never been higher. Mm -hmm. They have never been higher. Like, it's incredible. So the day's coming when uh, somebody's going to look in the cupboard and say, you know, we've lost this, and what's the point? Now, do and you then, ever, Derek, do you ever talk with refiners um, uh, who, not who mention too often. I mean, I do indirectly, you know, talk mm -hmm. to people who deal with refineries, but I don't often talk to refineries. Uh, although I, one of the things I find interesting, which which is sort of related to f refineries, I can't believe the number of vaults being built. <laughs> oh right! <laughs> <laughs> like we get more vault, we get probably four thousand tons of voltage built every year, but theoretically we're only mining an extra twenty seven hundred tons, which is also a statement about what's going on in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking with a guy who uh, who does talk with with the refiners and and mentioned that there's one refiner in in Switzerland which has a 
has a bounty up. If anybody sees a Chinese Mark Bar come through for refining, uh, there's a, a reward out. Because the yeah, idea yeah. is that China refines 400 tons a year from their domestic supply, and they put their stamp on it, and none of that's shown up in the market anywhere. So we're reasonably right. certain that China's domestic production stays in-house, and, and so that adds to their stockpile. But it, also they were noting that they're starting to see bars which have numbers on them that indicate that they were created you know, back in the 60s. And, sure. and so they're starting to see what they consider to be old, dusty stuff, you know, bottom of the yeah. vault kind of stuff coming out Absolutely. and it's coming through. And so yeah. these are just the little clues that somebody somewhere is scraping into their vaults to uh, make sure there's there's something in the market. I can tell you that about five years ago, maybe four years ago, I was discussing with a processor of gold that he was going to get melt bars, U.S. melt bars made available to him. <laughs> and, of course, these melt bars were when they confiscated the gold in the 30s. And, of course, you, you don't go there because, obviously, it's at the bottom of the heap, right? And, it's of course, your lowest quality gold. But, and that was quite a while ago. And, of course, I think that, as I thought in 12, I think, gee, they can't have much gold left here because I, I went into gold in 2000 because I was reading this Frank Venerosa book where he suggested that the central bank said they had, I think it was 35,000 tons, and he thought they only had 18. Mm -hmm. And I sit there and say, well, I think... Demand has exceeded supply by 2,000 tons a year for the last 10 years. How much can they have left? <laughs> and I, I sort of find it interesting that the next year they had to raid the GLD, uh -huh. you know, to get the extra, uh, an extra 850 tons. <laughs> it just kind of fits in, right? Right. And, and, of course, they had to get the Indians not to buy. Well, of course, the Indians are buying again. So I think we've got things going our way here in gold and silver, notwithstanding what's going on in the, in the paper markets. Yeah, and, and it's uh, it's certainly been frustrating. So, if you're looking for a turnaround, do you think you we see the turnaround in the in the paper markets first as this comes due, or or do you think there is some uh, dislocation in the physical market that then ha has to wag the tail over in the in the COMEX market? Well, I think it's got to come from the physical market first. Mm -hmm. I think that, and of course, when when the mints say they don't have any more silver coins, hey, you're short silver. There's more demand than supply. Mm -hmm. Maybe you start figuring it out, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, you see the Chinese inventories went down by 1,000 tons from 1,100 to 100, and you think, well, okay, how long can I keep playing this game? Maybe I should be reversing myself. Maybe, in fact, we've had you know, enough of a retracement that there's some speculators come in there and come in and, and take fresh positions, and all of a sudden it's turned around. But to me, the biggest win will be if there is a failure, you know, that somebody says we're, we're, we were promised some gold and we didn't get it. And, and that could happen with these expiries coming up at the end of this month. It could happen. I mean, we just can't have China continue to buy 60 tons a week. That is impossible that that, that could possibly be supplied unless, you know, they're just down to the last vestiges of some kind. Or somebody does a deal where they, they borrow it from some existing uh, holder and uh, non-transparently pay him some big interest rate. I mean, that could happen too, right? People will, people in power will do anything to make sure that what they want tries to manifest itself in the market. So, even and even going to the Swiss referendum, even the, if the yes vote wins, I will guarantee you there will be so many reasons to delay the Swiss National Bank doing everything that nothing will manifest itself. Well, let's talk about those in power real quickly uh, because uh, th this is a concern that I I've heard voice. So, so let's imagine hypothetically that the gold is being suppressed because there's a larger set of policies being run that they can't have gold uh, being the canary in the coal mine or crying foul around these. So, so gold is held down. But here's the problem with gold. It's a com real commodity and it has money-like characteristics. And so it, there's this relationship between supply and demand and price. And so as the price has been pushed down, all the supply has been headed from west to east. At some point, here's the concern, that the, the guardians of the gold in the West say, we can't have any more going east. And, and they have two options. One is to let the price rise to normalize that flow so it, so it stops flowing. And the second is to do something like just uh, more around the idea of capital controls, making it illegal, freezing it, otherwise uh, being dictatorial around, around their response and doing whatever, making it illegal or something like that. Where, where do you fall on that? How, when this finally erupts, do you, do you really think that it, price will, will be the, the moderating factor, or do you think they'll try other maybe less, less honest means? Well, I mean, I, I don't really 
see, I, I don't know that the, the, the powers, that the central powers, the Western governments, can do much about it. I mean, if you don't have any gold, what are you going to do, right? And, and maybe they could try to confiscate everybody's gold. Most people have gold are, of course, trying to find safe jurisdictions to, to have that gold in where it won't be affected by uh, the Western governments, whether it's in your home or whether it's in Singapore or some other, you know, some place where you think it's uh, away from the, uh, the grubby hands of the uh, central banker. But I think if they, you know, if they announced that, I mean, what would happen to the price of metal even in the paper markets? <laughs> it might go crazy. So it would be really funny if the paper market started going up and everybody lost their gold. I mean, that would just be the worst of all, the worst of all developments for us. But I think the the physical is going to win the day here. There's just no doubt about it. Well, fantastic. So uh, with that, I, I see we've uh, used up uh, our, our time for today. I really want to thank you for your insights in this. And and I got to tell you, I'm uh, I, this has been a, this has been a long hard run for me because. Uh, <laughs> I'm a rational guy and I've been adding up all the numbers and I know what should be happening and what should be happening is not what's actually happening right now. And boy, I find that frustrating. And for two reasons. One, it's just intellectually frustrating. But secondarily, on a more visceral level, I'm of the mind that the longer they string this out, the worse the eventual correction is going to be. You know, we, we've stretched this rubber band way past its snapping point, And boy, I think it's going to be a hell of a snap when it breaks. And that, just, that bothers me as a citizen of a, of a, of a world and a country I care about. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the same thing for me. I mean, you wake up every morning and I hardly even watch the television anymore. What's the point of this? I mean, whatever's going to happen in the market is to some extent predetermined by someone who where bears no relationship to fundamentals. And the uh, same thing in the gold market. And, of course, what you have, the only thing we can hope is that the physical uh, appetite changes things, right? That, that there are unintended consequences of these things. And I love the fact that people can buy so much of these products uh, today versus the price three years ago. I mean, to think you can buy three times more silver with the same amount of money, that's phenomenal. It takes one-third of the amount of money to, to take out the inventory today versus three years ago. So it's, it's going to happen here. There's no doubt about it. I just, I, it's only a question of time, and this, this uh, economy is so loosey-goosey here. There is no recovery going on. They can paint all the data they want, and tell us that inflation is only 2%. We all know it's not 2%. You know, it's funny. I was, I was with a, a guy who ran a mining company. He said, well, I guess gold's down because there's no inflation. I said, well, why is it that the cost of production goes has gone up 8% a year for the last 13 years, and yet you say there's no inflation? <laughs> and uh, yeah. he put it off to maybe lower, lower grades and increase the cost. So I said to him, well, you know, you had a project you were going to start in 2000. It was going to cost X for capital expenditures. Now it's going to cost eight times X. What does that tell you about inflation? I mean, we see so many examples of it in real life, right? And then we're all told that inflation is 2% a year. I mean, it's just hogwash. <laughs> it's, it's like that old Richard Pryor quote, who are you going to believe, me or your lion eyes? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I, I share your frustration. It's very difficult, you know, when, when you've been in these markets for so long, and most of the things you imagine happen happen in a reasonable time. It might be frustrating. you got to wait a year or so. But to wait, you know, three years for this, and maybe five years when you think about QE to play out, oh my God, it's been very trying on all of us, but uh, hopefully our day will come here. Absolutely. Well, Eric Sprott, thank you so much for your time today, and I uh, hope we can do this again. Okay, Chris, keep up the good work. Thank you. You too. Okay. All the best.